Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. We got a fun and exciting show. And I will say it has something to do, I believe, with a schnauzer. And everybody knows here I'm a big schnauzer lover, so I see uh, maybe a little puppy in here that's a schnauzer. Uh, but we're going to talk to uh, Ruth Behar and Gabriel Fry Behar. And they're the authors of the book Papita Meets Papita. So we're excited about it. It's a fun, fun book, a great storyline. And I want to talk to them a little bit about the book and about the writing styles and how it all came about. So everybody hang tight. We'll come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. And join us now is authors and a whole list of, of awards and massive, massive uh, popularity here. Ruth Behar, Gabriel Fry Behar, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice Thank to you. be here. Yeah, it's great to have you guys on board. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the book. And the book is called Pepita Meets Pepita. So tell us a little bit about, we'll start with Ruth. Tell us a little bit about the book and the storyline, and uh, we'll sort of take it from there. Definitely. Well, it's a book that Gabriel and I wrote together. It's a mother-son production, and uh, we decided to write it because our lives changed dramatically um, at the end of 2020 when uh, Gabriel became a dad and I became a grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. I became a papi and I became an abuelita or an abuela. And um, so we were very excited, of course. And But we were noticing that um, our lovely dog, or really Gabriel and his wife's dog, I'm, I'm just like, I just get to visit with their dog. But their lovely dog was looking very confused and wondering what was happening because she was used to being the baby of the family and suddenly there was this other baby <laughs> and she was getting all the attention. And so our Pepita was just um, looking like a little sad about all this. And so we were living that experience and decided we'd write a book about it. That's a great thing. Now, Gabriel, is it a Schnauzer or a Terrier or a mix? So the real life dog was a rescue, a total mystery mix. Um, they told us she was presumed to have a chihuahua mom <laughs> and then we did a we did a dna test and it confirmed that seemingly and then the other side is just pure carrier poodle schnauz just kind of like all of the above um but then i think the illustrator i think she did end up making it more of a kind of a schnauzer mix so less of a kind of like you know um like rescue mix than than the real life dog that the story was inspired by. There you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, I love it. We're big fans of rescue, obviously. And uh, as you you may or may not know, as I alluded to, uh, we are my home is a Schnauzer home for months <laughs> they're not barking, so uh, <laughs> un, un terrier like for sure. And uh, I, I used to be the uh, president of a, a local humane society, and we would get uh, wonderful, wonderful dogs in and, and look to get them to their right and perfect forever homes. And I will admit, at times, it was like a stab at. Well, it kind of is a schnauzer, kind of, uh, and, and so we we basically would wait till the new adopters would come to uh, the facility or come to one of our events, and they would say, "Well, I've been looking for a chihuahua." Oh, well, we've got one right here. <laughs> you know, must down, push down the uh, mustache a little bit. It's a chihuahua right here. <laughs> 
to add on to what my mom had said, I mean, the inspiration, when we adopted our dog from the rescue, she was very, uh, very young. Um, I, for, I think the exact like legal age in New York was something like eight to 10 weeks. Mm-hmm. And the rescue had gotten a, a few uh, like siblings. And so they needed to kind of like find homes for them as quickly as possible. Uh, so that was why there was kind of like an unknown about what she would be. But it also meant that, like, for her, we really were, like, her air quotes, like, surrogate parents. <laughs> because, you know, we've had her since she was really, like, a puppy puppy, which I think was part of why the shock of another baby coming into the <laughs> coming into the house was something where she was, I don't know, like, I feel like my mom and I have had different opinions on this. Like, I don't know that she was sad, per se, more that she was like, wait, this is, like, it <laughs> um and it was just such a big adjustment to her baseline that she was like extremely confused obviously so that was what we were trying to capture is just that moment of like oh whoa like you know life is good life is normal and then suddenly uh you know a completely unexpected new uh new si- sibling enters the picture and then how that then changes everybody's place in the family Absolutely. So was this uh, anticipated or was this something you figured out the dog would figure it out or, you know, uh, how did that come about? It was definitely, we assumed that, so our, our real dog's name is Eloise. Eloise, <laughs> After, okay. El- Eloise at the Plaza. Uh, and that's very much her spirit also. She's like blonde, fluffy, very like rascally. We assumed that she'd be great and she has been completely completely like, like actually in, in reality like she adjusted very quickly she loves playing with kids she's always loved kids so we were I, that gave us a lot of confidence that she'd be ultimately like totally happy to have uh human babies crawling around so yeah so she adjusted in in the reality of like our small new york city apartment she adjusted remarkably quickly but obviously like when my mom was visiting that first week or so especially in like in the way that a dog can be so expressive with just like the most minimal shifts of her eyebrows raising, lowering, looking away, slowly walking, like walking into the room and then say, like having that expression on their face where they're like, oh, okay, I guess this is baby time. And then turning around and just slowly walking out of the room, like all of that told so many stories. So like, so elegantly and quickly that it was like, it's very memorable to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's a big adjustment, big adjustment for everyone, four-legged ones and two-legged ones for sure. So, uh, Ruth, how did the uh, concept of the particular type of book, because obviously you've been a, a prize-winning author, you've written uh, several middle-grade, uh, middle-aged youth books, et cetera, and uh, you're a professor. So how did the decision come about saying, okay, the, the biggest impact or the biggest joy in writing the book would be to put it in more of a, a young version of the book with a lot of great illustrations? Yeah, that's such a good question. Well, I had written a previous picture book, my first picture book, Tia Fortuna's New Home. So I had just kind of gotten into the genre of writing um, a text for a picture book and had really loved it, had loved working with the artist and, you know, creating a text that then an artist just decides, you know, how they're going to make it come alive with pictures. And I just enjoyed that experience so much. And when we started writing this, it just seemed like a picture book was the right genre. We'd be able to tell it from Pepita's point of view, right? So that was like the first decision that we made with the book. It's like, we're going to tell it from the dog's point of view, because it could have been from one of the, um, the, the mom or the dad or the grandparents, right? It could have been from any number of points of view or the baby's point of view for that matter. But but we thought, no, it's going to be Pepita's point of view. We want we want the dog to tell the story. And it just seemed like a picture book would be perfect. We were kind of imagining these like cute pictures <laughs> that would accompany the text. And it just seemed like the right way to go. We thought it would be very vivid and kind of seeing everything from, from the dog's point of view, what the dog sees, what the dog feels. And it just seemed like the right genre. And it was also something that we could do together. You know, I could write a paragraph and then Gabriel could write a paragraph. Um, We just were very complimentary Um, also. And Gabriel comes from a filmmaking background and I come from anthropology and creative writing background. So we were also just very complimentary with each other. Gabriel was really good sometimes at cutting things I wrote, you know, because he comes from a film background. He'd go, no, cut that. We don't need (laughs) 
<laughs> but it made sense because he, you know, he comes from film. And so, so he understands like, you know, like words that aren't needed on the page because the art is going to tell us that part of the story. So I think it was exactly the right genre for us to work in together because I'd written that previous book and enjoyed the experience. And Gabriel, coming from a filmmaking experience, had a really good sense of how words and images can work together. Yeah, absolutely. And it does a brilliant job of that. So uh, big kudos on that for sure. And you talk about words. Now, that there's a, a kind of a, what I'll call a unique twist, a plot line twist, Gabriel, we'll call it here. And the words in the book, uh, tell us a little bit about that because it's not all English. Yeah, that was very important for us to try to make it like multicultural, to try to bring in our Cuban American heritage so that the the characters, you know, obviously it's a universal experience having kids and having having uh, a pet like a, like a dog. On top of that, though, we wanted to be able to bring in that that background so that the story had as much kind of specificity and texture as possible. And then on top of that, obviously, once you have kids, there's the feeling of wanting to pass on another language. So in our case, Spanish, which uh, my mom obviously is a native Spanish speaker. I grew up learning it at home uh, from her and from my grand my Cuban grandparents. So figuring out a way to bring in a little bit of Spanglish so that kids that may not already have that background uh, can start to learn how some of the words that we say in English could be said in Spanish. Um, and then on top of that, also, I think it's fun to imagine the, this obviously the story from the point of view of the dog, but more specifically the point of view of like a bilingual multicultural family so that the, um, the specificity of that that framing can kind of hopefully show people something about you know a culture that they're maybe not familiar with. So that was, that was part of our our thinking with it. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think it's great in, in the back of the book is a a one page of those words that are included in the text of the main text of the book itself. So I, I thought that was brilliant, and I love how you phrased that and how how the thought pattern was that uh, you know uh, children are going to be reading this, and now they have a reference, a, a quick, easy reference, and go back to the back of the book and see what these these words are. And uh, if their family is not skilled enough to speak Spanish, then they can get one on up on their mom and dad. So it works out real well for the kid, that's for sure. So I love that. And my uh, my mother in law, she is originally from Panama, and uh, she still uh, she, I wouldn't say she's fluent, but she can speak some of the words, and she still throws out some of those words like mira. You know, she's trying to get my attention on something. Uh, usually, it's Boca Grande or Grande Boca. However, you want to put. It. <laughs> but anyway, I just love how it, it flows like that because I was expecting. You know, I know the book came out in uh, an all Spanish version too. Correct. Yes, yes. It came out simultaneously in, in Spanish and this more bilingual version. I love that flow and, and the learning opportunities uh, that come along with, with the book as well as the, the pictures themselves. So big kudos on that. Thank you. I should add that, you know, it's not just the family that's bilingual, but so is the dog. You know, Pepita knows Spanish. That's right. That's right. So even though it's a terrier, which is sort of a German heritage, it, uh, <laughs> we didn't go down that route. But hey, there's another idea for a book. You know, we can spin this off a little bit. But anyway, just full of all kinds of great ideas. So this is your, correct me if I'm wrong, this is your first uh, book together, working together. And I love how you said, Ruth, uh, you said you divide it, like you would write a chapter and Gabriel would write a chapter. But how was the flow without getting into family squabbles on, on the air here? But how was that flow? How did that work? Because in, and also, the, I know I'll sound old school here, but the distance, because Ruth, you're in uh, now in Michigan, right? And uh, Gabriel, you're in uh, New York. Now, I know there's this thing called the Internet. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not totally old school. I'm not climbing a telephone pole and talking to people. But how did that flow work? How did you guys decide what the chapters would be, flowing it back and forth and putting in, uh, the right illustrations together? Did you divide it up into to different ways other than per chapter? Well, we did get together in person sometimes too. So it wasn't all from a distance, but you know, we definitely were emailing different drafts of the text to one another. And, you know, we would just try things out. You know, I would suggest something and write it out. And then Gabriel maybe would rephrase it or change it or say, no, what about this idea? Then I'd get it back from him. I'd go, oh, okay, I really like that, but how about this? You know, and so we were just very good at communicating with each other. And we've joked about this at a recent uh, bookstore event in New York. We were kind of saying that probably 
with most family members, we wouldn't be able to co-write a book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I mean, we were joking about this, like this isn't possible with everybody or even with friends. But I think, well, with Gabriel, because he's my son and obviously I adore him, you know, if he says, cut this, I don't like how this sounds, I'm not going to get upset at him. I might get upset at my husband if he told me that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm not going to get upset at my son. And so, so I, you know, so I think it was productive in that sense because we were really thinking of like, what's the best we can do to tell the story and really like getting our egos out of the way and not, you know, not saying, oh my God, this upsets me because this is like what I wrote. You know, we, we didn't do that because I think we really like, what's the best way that we can tell the story? As Gabriel said, how do we thread in the Spanish? So that feels graceful. Um, how do we move the story forward? The pacing, you know, we knew that Pepita was going to have to do something awful at some point, you know, to to have, you know, the, the mom get upset at her and, you know, and see what happens next. So we knew there was gonna be a kind of crisis in the story, but we weren't sure exactly what that was going to be. And so, you know, we worked that out as the story evolved. So what's so nice about the writing process is you have an idea of where you're going um, but you don't know everything, right? You know, you, you have to let yourself be surprised by the story itself. And I think that's what happened, that as we were writing, we kind of found the surprises and we found the things that that really seemed to move the story forward and to give it just a really nice arc, you know, so that, um, so that by the end of the story, Pepita's does no longer feeling left out, but feeling like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm still an, a member of this family and now I've got this little human sibling. <laughs> Gotta love it. Gotta love it. All right. We're going to take a, a quick commercial break. We'll come back uh, right after this break. Uh, continue our conversation with uh, Ruth Behar and Gabriel Fry Behar about the wonderful, wonderful book, Pepita Meets Babita. And I want to talk to them a little bit about the writing styles and also how their background, professional background as a uh, as a writer professor and a also a film expert, a filmmaker, writer, how that helped or how it hindered the situation. So everybody hang tight. We'll come back right after this break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Continue our conversation with authors Ruth Behar and Gabriel Fry Behar. And I have to give a, a shout out. I want to make sure I get Mirabelle's, the illustrator's last name is Lechuga. Maribel Lechuga. Lechuga. There we go. Big shout out to Mirabel Lechuga, a wonderful, wonderful illustrator. I, I just love everything that she did to put together the book. Now, had Ruth, had you worked with Mirabel in the past on uh, on previous books, or how did that? Because uh, I, I know selecting an illustrator sometimes. Okay, you think, okay, who do I know, and uh, who can I get on the cheap? But <laughs> for me, it's like you had to be very particular. You had to have someone that really understands the story and what the message is you're trying to get across. Yeah, well, Gabriel and I didn't get to choose Maribel Lechuga. Um, she was uh, found and selected by our publisher um, and our editor, and um, which was great. I hadn't worked with her before. My previous book, I worked with a different artist, so I didn't I didn't know her until we were introduced to her. And typically, the way it works with a picture book is the publisher will speak to two or three different illustrators and see which ones are available, which ones might be most appropriate and suitable for the book. 
And in this case, Maudie Bell was, was number one for this book. And fortunately, she liked the story very, very much. She loves the story. And so she wanted to illustrate it. And um, she is based in Spain, in Madrid, actually. And I had the good fortune to be in Madrid last summer. And I got to meet her, which was great. So, you know, so we, we were really working transnationally. And basically, you know, once we finished the text, once we got it to where we wanted it to be, and our editor agreed that it was good to go, then the text was sent to Maribel Lechuga, and then she worked on the art, and we got drafts of the of the art, first drafts, and we got to see it as sketches, and then we saw it colored in, and kind of step by step, and it was great. It was just such a great process to see it coming alive, and then deciding what the cover would be. So, you know, so we definitely, you know, got to state our opinions, but we were very happy with the work throughout and very excited to be working with her. Absolutely. And brilliant job. Brilliant job. And, and obviously a, a good excuse to get to Madrid, Spain. So I love that. Any chance you can get to do that is a win-win. I like it. I like it. Now, Gabriel, I, I sort of teased a little bit before the break about your background, obviously a writer, filmmaker, uh, photographer um, at the uh, NYU uh, Tisch School. So I understand your background. How did you feel about blending this into a book? Did you feel that your skill set and, and the things you do as a profession helped? I'm sure it did. But were there some ways that was a little bit of a challenge since it wasn't uh, necessarily a film or, or something, you know, your it was your first first picture book that you've worked on definitely i mean there i think the well and like my mom was saying like the ways in which film is often about figuring out what the heart of a scene is trying to drop the audience into things in the middle as much as possible you know that is obviously kind of like a blessing and a curse from a writing standpoint um, when you're working on something for kids because you you need a kind of like the full arc and the full trajectory for it i think to really land for children and having a kid and then now a second kid myself, you know, I was reading picture book after picture, picture book after picture book, night after night after night after night. So I was, I was starting to internalize the kind of almost like the rules of writing a picture book in a, in a meaningful way, I think. And, um, and obviously there's, there is overlap, like any kind of writing is in some ways like the others, there's always linkages, I think, in kind of like foundational storytelling ideas. And the bulk of what I teach is ultimately writing for the screen uh, for actors. So thinking of how you can use your own personal experience in a meaningful way as a writer. So that that experience from a, a teaching standpoint, I think was was the most helpful. You know, thinking of like, okay, this moment in time, I'm experiencing it, and how actually could I translate it? And I've always had this kind of like sticky like idea from actually my own childhood into young adulthood. Uh, that it wasn't actually my mom that said it, it was my dad and he would always say things along the lines of I wish I'd written down some of the stuff that was in my head when you were a kid because as soon as you were a kid that all kind of like evaporated <laughs> if you could never get yourself back in the mind frame of being a parent with a very young kid as you know as soon as the person uh, grows up then suddenly you're dealing with a, a first a young adult and then an adult so the relationship shifts your, you know, who you are as a parent. So that has always stuck with me. And so when my kids were are now old enough to to really listen to a book and think about it, that was kind of in the back of my head always is like, how could I write something that my own kid would respond to? And and obviously that was a very special moment when we actually get the book in the mail, open it up. The whole box is sitting there to her. It's like, okay, here is the book. This is, you know, this is the dog based on our dog. This is the baby based on you when you were a baby. And and part of the fun of the book too is obviously also the idea that a an older sibling, while the book is from the pr point of view of a dog, an older sibling could also kind of put themselves in the shoes of the dog. So the dog is also kind of like, in a way, a lens into just what it's like to be an older sibling and suddenly you have a younger brother or sister. So that was part of what we were hoping would make the book universally relatable, not just to people that have pets, even though that is a big part of it. My dog and my, <laughs> my wife and I always joke that like our dog really is our firstborn child. So that, that was really important to us as a family, but also to making this book come to life in the way that it did is that the, the dog's not just a pet for them. It really is their, their kid in a really real sense um so so anyway so that's all 
that's all the stuff that was kind of going through my head. But professionally, the big challenge with a picture book ultimately is just it's extremely concise. Even by film standards, you have under a thousand words usually. Oftentimes, the shorter the better, 800, 600 words. So you really have to figure out how to tell a full story with a beginning, middle, and end that hopefully does land uh, a real kind of like emotionally significant kind of like final uh, beat. And at the same time, how do you do that as quickly as possible without the story feeling rushed? That was tough. And that was really what I think the bulk of our work together focused on, you know, was and showing each other drafts, coming up with ideas, figuring out how you really shrink the actual word count without shrinking the story. So that was the, that was the, the big challenge. Absolutely. So when the book came across that your, uh, your daughter's the oldest, correct? Yeah, I've got two girls, uh, three, almost three year old. And now, uh, we are fully in the, the real kind of like, this is, I, I assume to, this to be one of the more intense moments of parenting, uh, that you, that you get in your whole life, a three year old, but still two, definitely still very two. And then an eight month old who's, who is actually starting to really, you know, there's such a transformative moment when you go from that six, seven, and then eight month moment where then suddenly you're seeing like real recognition in the eyes of a baby. So that's been amazing seeing that. So the, the, our younger, our younger one is really now, I think getting closer to the point that the book ends at. So that's also kind of a fun, a fun thing to now like relive in real time as a parent with a second kid. Absolutely. And what a legacy, what a legacy, you know, now she can look at this and both of them can look at this and have it for years to come and say, my dad did this, my abuela worked a puppy on this one. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's fantastic. I know when uh, my first book came out at the time, I had a, uh, a, a young niece, I think she was about five. And it did, the, the idea of the book didn't quite it wasn't a children or a picture book. So it really didn't grasp, you know, she did. It's like, oh, it's, you know, it's a book. Okay. But when she saw me on one of the good day or good morning talk shows, uh, making the rounds during the book tour, et cetera, uh, then it all hit home. It's like, oh my gosh, my, my uncle's a superstar. It's like, well, not quite, but I am on this talk show. So <laughs> it worked out all right. So Ruth and uh, Gabriel, when people pick up a copy of the book, Papita Meets Babita, and it's going to be a lovely read multiple, multiple times uh, over and over. What was the goal? What do you hope they get from it? Uh, is there an end result where if you're at a, a book signing event, someone says something to you, and you're like, that's exactly what I was trying to accomplish here. <laughs> well, I think it's just the idea of cariño, which is a word that we use in Spanish in the book. Uh, cariño, which means love, but it's sort of more than love. It's love, it's affection, it's... Um, it's staying together. All of that cariño just yeah, has to, like care, like care caring, yeah. caring and loving. It's sort of both. It's such a beautiful word in Spanish, cariño with the ñ and everything. Um, and so, so I think we wanted to, or at least as I see it, Gabriel, like we really wanted to um, communicate the idea of love. You know that we can expand the family and all love each other that pepita no don't worry you know we're not going to stop loving you because we now have another baby in the family we like the heart is big enough to to love many in a family so i think that was one of the, the ideas that was in my mind that um you know that the heart the heart can get bigger like there's more of us so the heart will grow a little bit more and have more space to love um so that was that was definitely one of the things that we were thinking about in cariño and that in that double sense of love and care. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, I love the message. I know there are many, many, many families, uh, just like your uh, family, uh, Gabriel, that have experienced this or are about to experience this. So this will give them a little bit of a leg up and in the message of uh, love and caring does definitely come through in the book. So big kudos. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where can our uh, fans find out more about you and uh, events, any activities you got going on? How's the best way to follow you? Um, best way, I think, is our websites. And we're on Instagram as well. Um, I think that's the best way. Gabriel, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you're at RuthBahar.com and I'm at GabrielFryBahar.com. And then, um, yeah, our Instagrams are both our names. And then I, and also the Penguin Random House website has obviously both a, a link to the book itself and then also has an events page so the the publicly posted events 
part there. So we were we were just at the Brooklyn Book Festival last uh, or two weekends ago. Yeah, and um, and then you'll be at my mom will be at the Boston Book Fair and then the yeah. Miami Book Fair as well. Sure. Pardon, sorry. Sorry, October twenty first. I'll be at the Boston Book Fair representing the two of us and Pepita. The three of us, I guess, um, yeah. <laughs> in Boston, and then we'll be at the Miami Book Fair as well, which is around, uh, I think it's around November 18th or so, right around that time. Uh, we plan to be there as well. Fantastic. Well, we'll share that out to all the fans. And if you guys are in those areas, definitely go by and say hello. I don't know what that is in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hola. That's what I thought. I was afraid to say it. <laughs> Never be afraid, Tim. Never be afraid. <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful. So everybody pick up a copy of the book. Once again, it's Papita Meets Babita by uh, Ruth Behar and Gabriel Fry Behar. Uh, both of you, thanks so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Great work. And we'll look forward to speaking with you uh, both. Hopefully, we got more books planned. I, I, I'm full of ideas. So just drop me a line. I'll give you some ideas. <laughs> we'll you. look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, we're uh, coming to the end of the show today. I want to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to thank the sponsors and producers for making this show possible. If you have any ideas, comments, or people you want to see on the show, drop us a line. You can go to PetLifeRadio.com, and we will do our best to answer your questions, entertain your comments, and bring on the people you want to hear from most. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful hosts and shows on Pet Life Radio. It's a cornucopia of great entertainment. So once again, it's PetLifeRadio.com. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life, and who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.